I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episode, episode 14, where we focused on the second letter of John the Apostle, I pointed out that in the time when John wrote his letters, hotels did not exist and inns were very few and far between. So during the time of the New Testament in the first century, people were largely dependent on someone opening up their home for them to stay. The practice of hospitality was not confined to the church. It was a common and accepted practice within the ancient world. The Greek and Roman world even had a god of hospitality. This god's name was Xenia or Zeus Xenios. The Greek word Xenos means stranger. In South Africa, the country where I live, we have had incidents within our own society of xenophobia, where foreigners and those that come from other countries are attacked by locals. The word xenophobia literally means the fear of strangers. Zeus Xenios was known as the god of strangers, and most Greek and Roman citizens understood that they were required by this god to take care of and to be kind to strangers. If the members of a family lived in a different part of the country, they were obliged to give each other hospitality whenever they travelled to those parts of the country. People carried what was called a symbolon. It was a token to identify themselves to their hosts, and the host would recognise the token as belonging to him and would open up his home to the bearers of the token. If pagan people did that, then Christians would certainly also practise hospitality. I would guess that the symbolon that Christians used would be the presence of Jesus Christ in their lives, that all Christians should show each other, and to the world. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 9 says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. The Greek word for hospitality is love of strangers. So it would be an accepted responsibility as a Christian to open up our homes to those we don't know particularly other believers who are strangers to us. Showing hospitality to others, particularly strangers, requires a level of trust and acceptance that many of us would be uncomfortable with. It forces us to rely on the common bond in Jesus Christ, rather than a particular blood relationship or shared experience. It would force us out of those comfort zones and into a territory where we need to place our trust in God. Both the second and third letters of John have a focus on the basic issue of hospitality, but both are from different sides of the same coin, as it were. Second John warns us against showing hospitality to false teachers, whereas third John condemns the lack of hospitality shown to faithful ministers of the word. Let us quickly return to second John for a moment, to chapter 1, verse 7 to 11. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Third John gives us a glimpse of the problems of personality within the church, and three different characters are mentioned in the letter. There was a man called Gaius, to whom this letter was written. There was another man named Diotrephes, and the third man named Demetrius. These three characters are like three kinds of Christians found in the church in any age, and like all the letters of the New Testament, 3 John is a very relevant letter for our modern world, and at the conclusion of this letter, we can ask ourselves which one of the three characters in 3 John are we most like. The first man mentioned is called Gaius. There are three Gaiuses mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. There was Gaius of Corinth, who was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 14. 
Then there was Gaius of Macedonia, who is mentioned in Acts chapter 19. And then there was Gaius of Derbe, who appears in Acts chapter 20, and is distinguished by Luke as Gaius of Derbe, not to be confused with Gaius of Macedonia. So you can see that Gaius is a very common name in New Testament times, as was the name of John. And we don't know which one of the three Gaiuses John is writing to, or if this Gaius is a fourth person of that name. But be that as it may, John evidently knew him, and addresses this letter to him in a warm and friendly way. We can gather from the letter that Gaius was a likable, gracious, and generous man. There are three things that John says about him that are important. Firstly, in 3 John 1 verse 2, he was strong of soul, and that encouraged John. Beloved, I pray all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, as it goes well with your soul. The Amplified Bible translation is perhaps a little bit more accurate. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as I know your soul prospers spiritually. This would be an encouraging thing to say to any believer. I wish you could be as strong in body as you are in spirit. Apply this test to us today. If your physical experience reflected your spiritual state, what would you look like? Would you be an athletic individual, powerful and full of vigor? Or would you be an infirm weakling, barely able to walk to the corner shop? Gaius was the sort of man that Apostle John admired. He wished his physical life was as strong as his spiritual life. Secondly, Gaius was consistent in his actions. 3 John 1 verse 3 says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. Gaius showed the truth in his life. What impressed John was not that Gaius knew the truth, but that he followed the truth and he lived it. In other words, he had integrity. He did not say one thing and live another. He walked in the truth. 3 John 1 verses 5 to 6 describes the third characteristic Gaius had. He was generous with his giving. Dear friend, you are showing your faith in whatever you do for other believers, especially when they are your guests. These believers have told the congregation about your love. You will do well to support them on their trip in a way that proves you belong to God. One of the signs that any person has been genuinely touched and changed by the presence of Jesus Christ in his life is that they are generous with their money. His giving becomes generous, gracious and cheerful just the way that pleases God. Gaius was faithful and loyal in his giving. This means that he is regular and systemic in his giving. He does not give when his emotions are moved or he felt guilty, but he planned his giving and he carried it through, faithfully continuing with any commitment he had made to the work of God. It is also obvious that he gave cheerfully because John says, you will do well to assist them and send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. God never wants us to give because we feel we have to, or because somebody is taking a special offering, or to feel that if we do not give we will be despised by other Christians. Gaius gives because he delights in giving. The second character John mentions in his letter is Diotrephes. We read about him in 3 John 1 verses 9 to 11. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. This is the first example in the New Testament church of someone being a church boss, someone who tries to be in charge of a local church. It is unclear if he was an elder or a deacon or perhaps even a pastor. 
But what we do know is that Diotrephes was someone who thought his role in church was telling everyone else what to do. Apparently, if he did not like somebody or disagreed with someone, he would cast them out of the church. John objects to that, and the apostle points out that Diotrephes was guilty of four especially wrong attitudes and actions. Firstly, John says that this man was guilty of slandering the apostle. The Revised Standard Version and the King James Version uses the word prating is an old English word that means to utter empty or foolish words. Diotrephes rejected the authority of the Apostle John. We know from other letters in the New Testament that the Apostles had a unique role in the history of the Church. They were to lay the foundations of the Church and were given the authority to settle all questions within the Church. It is these same apostolic words that have been passed along to us in the New Testament, and this is why the New Testament is so authoritative for Christians. So Diotrephes not only disregarded the authority of the Apostle John, but he even spoke against him. He said slanderous and evil things against the Apostle. Secondly, John says that Diotrephes refused to welcome the traveling ministers of the gospel who went about from place to place speaking the truth of God when they came to this congregation. Diotrephes would have nothing to do with them. He turned them away and refused to allow them to speak in the church. Thirdly, he even put the people out of the church who would have offered hospitality to these visiting preachers. Not only did he object to the visiting ministers, but he also objected to those who would have hosted them. This habit, even today, leads to a wide divisiveness within the church, doing a lot of harm and injury to all. The fourth offence is by far the most serious. Diotrephes puts himself first. He loved to be first, which immediately tells us that he was acting in the flesh. This is always the ruling principle of the flesh. Me first. I call it the unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. In doing this, Diotrephes was robbing the Lord Jesus of his right to be first. It is Jesus who has the right to preeminence. He should be first, but here is a man who puts himself first, and that is a really serious sin. Unfortunately, there are plenty of men just like Diotrephes in our churches today, and they will always be characterized by this attitude. They want to be first. They want the glory meant for Jesus for themselves. They have robbed God of his inheritance plundering that which alone belongs to God. What was John's counsel in this situation? He does not advise Gaius to split away from the church, but rather says the following in 3 John chapter 1, verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. John tells Gaius and us, the readers, to not follow these men who want the preeminence and seek the glory. If we see someone who is always jockeying for the prime position in Christian relationships, always wanting to be in the public eye, do not follow him. John says this man is following his own way and not that of God. The third character John mentions is Demetrius. All we know about him is what John says in a single verse. Verse 12. Everyone says good things about Demetrius, and the truth agrees with what they say. Also, we say good about him, and you know what we say is true. John is speaking here as an apostle with the spiritual gift of discernment. John is saying, I want to say what everyone thinks about Demetrius. Here is a man you can trust. Here is a man of truth. Evidently, Demetrius was the bearer of this letter to Gaius, and was probably one of those missionaries who travelled from place to place that John refers to earlier. I would like to return to verse 7 and 8 so that I can comment further on Demetrius, because these verses describe the kind of man he was. For they have set out for his sake, and accepted nothing from the brethren. So we ought to support such men that we may be fellow workers in the truth. These words describe traveling missionaries. 
they would go from place to place and would probably enjoy the hospitality of various churches they visited. They labored as evangelists in that area, reaching out into places where the church had not yet gone, being supported and strengthened by these local churches. John mentions some noteworthy things about these missionaries. Firstly, he says that they went out and they have left things behind. They gave up the income of their secular work and obeyed this higher calling. But not everyone goes out. Some, such as Gaius, stayed to help support these men. But there were others that the Holy Spirit had called for a special task. And that is stated in verse 7. For his sake. This literally means for the name's sake the name of Jesus. During the time of the Old Testament, the Jewish scribes treated the name of God in a unique way. The name of God, Jehovah, was called a tetragrammaton. This means four letters, and was considered unspeakable by the Jewish scribes, who would only use four Hebrew letters for God. Y-H-W-H. They dared not write the name out completely. When the scribe wrote the name of God, he would change the pen right away and continue with another one. So reverently did they regard the name of God. In the New Testament, then, the name is that of Jesus. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11 that, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The reverence and concern for the name of Jesus was the driving motive for missionary work in the first century, and it should be the primary motive for missionaries today. It should never be the need of the people that calls believers out to different parts of the world to preach the gospel, because need is abundant everywhere. Everyone without Christ is in need. Sometimes those with the greatest need are not those with physical needs. They might lack nothing materially but are wretched in their inner spirit. I would like to remind you of what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3 verses 17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. These people need the name of Jesus in their lives. Not everybody is called to be a missionary. John gives those who stay at home to support the work of God a wonderful acknowledgement in verse 8. So we ought to support such men, that we may be fellow workers in the truth. No one should feel inferior or not worthy because they are not missionaries preaching the gospel. They are fellow workers in the truth. John closes his third letter with very similar words to his second letter. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. Once again, John uses the Greek phrase stoma pro stoma, that is translated as face to face, but literally means mouth to mouth. It holds the deeper meaning of two people communicating directly with each other without any barriers or distance. It means to speak in person directly. Third John is a very intimate letter. It is almost as if the letter is from the Lord Jesus himself, as if he is saying to his own church, I have many things that I want to tell you, but I don't want to use pen and ink, and ends with a wonderful promise, I hope to visit you soon. Then we can be together and talk. John, the Apostle of Love, is now the only Apostle left, already deep in his nineties. He had accumulated so many friendships and relationships, and yet he knew the names of the people in his life. He finishes his last letter by emphasizing how important friendship is, fellowship is, and peace in the church. Do you remember what I asked you at the beginning of this podcast? Which one of the three characters in 3 John are we most like? Gaius, Diotrephes, 
or Demetrius. Although 3rd John is so short and could have easily been written on a single papyrus sheet, it still has some vital truths that we can take with us. Verse 3. Know the truth and walk in the truth. Verse 8. Be hospitable to those who preach the truth. And verse 11. Pattern your life on the character of God. The result will be that there will be peace in the church and God will be glorified in His church. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 15.